بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قول أما بعد All praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I testify that there is no God except Allah and I testify that Muhammad is the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah. And brothers and sisters, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those who sacrifice and strive for his pleasure and to make us from amongst those who attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obtain the paradise in the hereafter. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, وَمَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever takes a path of seeking knowledge, whosoever takes a path in seeking knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make an easy path for them to enter the Jannah. If there's one path that you want to enter the Jannah directly, and if there's one path, that you want to reach to your goal, an ultimate goal, and that's the Jannah, without any shortcuts of the right or the left, and without any obstacles, the way to reach the Jannah and the way that you could obtain the Jannah is through knowledge. Because the path of knowledge is a direct path to the paradise. The path of knowledge is a direct path to the Jannah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people that enter the Jannah. Amen. Continuing with Riyadh al-Salihin, which is the hadith book that's been compiled by this great Imam and prominent Imam, Imam al-Nawi, rahimahullah ta'ala. And this book, as I mentioned to you before, the Imam al-Nawi, what he did, he looked at all the authentic hadith books and he selected particular and selective ahadith that fit with the chapters and the topics that he wants to address that fit in our day-to-day, in our day-to-day -to -day lifestyle, in our day-to-day -day needs, what we need to know as Muslims, what we need to know as those who live their day-to-day -day from the morning to the evening and so on. And as I mentioned to you before, the way that Imam and Nawi patterned his book and the way he compiled this book, he'll start with the topic, the chapter, so he'll name and put the title of the chapter, chapter then he'll address it by first and foremost by the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then by the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tonight insha'Allah we will start with chapter number 12, this chapter that Imam al nawi called باب الحث على الازدياد من الخير في أواخر العمر. This chapter which is urging people to do good at the end of their lives. So urging people in general and believers in particular when they get to the age of 40 and so on to do the righteous actions and good deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرَ وَجَاءَكُمْ النَّذِيرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Did we not give you lives long enough so that whosoever would receive admonition could receive it and the warner came to you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this verse, Reminding those who live long, reminding those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them extra life. What do we mean by extra life? Some people live a very short life. And some people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them an extra life than others. At the end of the day, your birth and your death is decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not by you. Your birth is decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you were born. And where were you born? And your death is also decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you'll die and where you'll die. It's not up to you. It's not up to anyone. 
it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah azza wa jal decrees upon you or anyone else where they'll born and where they'll die. That's one thing that you have no control over. You don't have control over your birth and you don't have control over your death. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to know from the very beginning that you exist in this world, that everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not your hands. Everything is by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not by what you wish. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wants you to remember and acknowledge that your ending is also by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. You can't live longer, you can't live longer than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And you can't live less than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. You can't exist in this world without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. And you can't exist whenever you want, and you can't end your life whenever you want, even though, even though people commit suicide. But keep in mind that at the end of the day, that's by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You chose to do something, but Allah Azza wa had also Allah Azza wa had also decreed upon you that you'll be dying at that time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to acknowledge and understand that your beginning is by the end of by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Your end is by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you start understanding those two, that your beginning is by the will of Allah, your ending is by the will of Allah, then in between you need to live in accordance to the way of Allah. So if your beginning is by the will of Allah and your ending is by the will of Allah, you are a slave and a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not your choice. It's not up to you what you want in this world. It's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do in this world. And that's the test that Allah azza wa jalla wants to test us. That's the test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through. He is the one that created death. And he is the one that created life to test you to see the best of doers. So the creator of death is Allah and the creator of life is Allah. Now what I'm saying and these things that we are saying are things that we all know of. Things by our natural instinct we understand. Things which are common sense to us. But the, the reality is and the truth is we don't act upon them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created us in this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that takes us away from this world. As Allah azza wa jalla says in the Quran al-Kareem, He is the one that grants life. He is the one that grants death. Yuhi wa yumid. He gives life to whoever he wants. He gives death to whoever he wants. Now that's something simple we all understand. And every Muslim understands that. Even non-Muslims who believe in the existence of God, they also know that the one that created life and the one that created death is Allah azza wa jal. But the thing is, people have a struggle or people struggle to understand what's in between those two, that your life must be also in accordance to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You entered in this world by the will of Allah, and you've entered into the world of Allah, therefore you need to live your life in accordance to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you enter someone's house, the first moment that you enter someone's house, the first thing that crosses your mind, that you are entering someone else's house, therefore you need to abide by the laws or the rules of the owner of the house or the owner of the palace or those who are responsible for this place. It's natural. When you go to a company, you enter a company, you enter a shopping center or you enter any place, the first thing that crosses your mind by you entering this place, you need to abide by the laws or the rules of this place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wants us to know and Allah wants us to acknowledge that the moment that we enter this world, we're entering Allah's world by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, we need to abide by the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to obey Allah azza wa jal. We need to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah reminds us many times in the Quran al-Kareem about He is your creator and He is your sustainer. And he is the one that made you exist. And he is the one that will take you out of this world. And he is the one that grants life. And he is the one that grants death. But as I mentioned, unfortunately, we struggle to understand in between those two. We struggle to understand between birth and death. We struggle to understand what Allah Azza wa commands us to do in between birth and death.
For that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in this verse, isn't he the one that gave you long life? He is the one that gives you long life, Allah azza wa jal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you exist in this world. You begin with zero. You begin with zero life. And then it starts to expand. It starts to increase. And then you become 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40, 50, 60, 70. But there are people in the past in which Allah Azza wa made them live for a thousand years or even more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says about Nuh alayhi salam, he called his people and preached to his people for 1,000 years. That does not include the life that he lived before. And that's why the scholars say Nuh alayhi salam lived up to 1,200 years. 200 years before the prophecy and 1,000 years calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is the one that made that same human being to live 1,200 years and another human being to live one day or even to live one minute? And us, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that the age and the duration of the life of my nation is between 60 and 70 years. That's an average life. If someone goes beyond 70 years old, you say, MashaAllah, he's getting old. And now people are dying 50 years old, even 40 years old. And you know what? It's becoming a, co a common phenomena that people are even dying 30 years old and 25 years old. How common is that becoming where you hear about a teenager who's even 17, 18 years old just collapsed and died? Or someone who's 24 or 25 just collapsed and died? Or someone who's 34 or 35 just collapsed and died? There's nothing, there's nothing that indicated to their illness or sickness. Someone who's healthy, someone who's fit and subhanAllah just dies. Because the life is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. Life is in the hands of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. He gives it to whoever He wants. He'll take it away from whoever He wants. And Allah Azza wa Jal is the one that made that very same person, that very same creation of Allah, that some will live up to a thousand years and others only will live a day or two. And Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is the one that made the average duration of the life of some people a thousand years old. And others, their average life duration is 70 and 60 years old, as the Prophet Muhammad says. There's a narration which some of the scholars might classify it as weak, but it says that once Musa السلام, went past an old woman. He went past an old woman that was grieving and crying over the death of her son. So Musa السلام, asked her, why are you crying and to whom are you crying over? She said, I'm crying over the death of my son. I'm crying over the death of my son. So Musa alayhi salam asked her, how old did you, or how old was your son when he died? So she said, he was 300 years. Miskin baby, yani. Very young. 300 years. So Musa alayhi salam, he says, Allah had informed me that there will be a nation that belongs to Ahmad Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that their average life, the average of the duration of their life, is between 60 and 70 years old. So she responded to Musa alayhi salam and she said, if that's the case that people will only live 60, 70 years old, I'll just spend it prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll spend that 60, 70 years just prostrating to Allah azza wa jal. 60, 70 years. It's like you're talking in a few days, a few years of our life. But Allah azza wa jal is the one that made this human being to live up to a thousand, a thousand years or more. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that made this human being to live 60 or 70 years. It's all in the hands of Allah. Allah azza wa jal is the one that prolongs your age. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that decreases. Allah azza wa jal is the one that decreases the duration of your life. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, عن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أعذر الله إلى امرئ أخر أجله حتى بلغ ستين سنة. The Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم he says that Allah عز وجل does not excuse a servant of his that went beyond the age of sixty. Allah doesn't have any more excuses. For a servant of his that went beyond the age 
of 60. So he is or she is above the age of 60. Which means what? The hadithia, it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks for excuses for anyone. But the hadithia in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that Allah azza wa jal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had given this man, had, even, had given this woman the ability to worship Allah azza wa jal and to do many things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that he is the one that had embedded in you the love of things, the love of the worldly matters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created in you the love of your inner self and the love of your desires. It's subhanallah, it's created in us. Allah is the one that created the desires and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created evilness in us and He is the one that created goodness in us. And it's up to you as a mu'min, it's up to you as a believer to let your good side overtake and overpower your evil side. And the way you do that, you let your iman help you. Your iman, your faith, and your belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, your consciousness of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will always help you to let your good side to override and overtake your bad side. But when you don't have faith in Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala and you don't have consciousness of Allah Azza wa Jal, you don't have iman, then your evil side will override your good side. And that's why you look at some people that are so evil. They are so evil and so bad that they don't have any boundaries. They let the evil side override and overtake their good side. But with your iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your belief in Allah azza wa jal and your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and reading the Quran and acting upon it, you will allow and give yourself that strength. You'll empower yourself with that strength and power to let your goodness ever override and overpower your evilness. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying in this hadith, that once a man or a woman reaches the age of 60, they have no excuse for them to say that I continue disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. Once they reach the age of 60, they have no more excuses for them to fall in the haram. What excuse do you have for someone who's 60 years old that continues to fornicate, that continues to commit adultery, that continues to take drugs, that continues to gamble, that continues to commit the haram? What excuse does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have for him? 60 years old, as we said, Brink of his death. He's on the, on the edge of dying. As we say. He's on the brink of his graveyard. Of his grave. What excuse does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have for him? Someone who's old. He's weak. Not strong. Probably can't see well. Can't even walk well. Can't even speak well. Can't even hear well. And yet this person wants to continue disobeying Allah azza wa jal. And yet this person wants to continue committing the haram. And yet this person wants to continue to indulge himself in the haram and the sins. What excuse does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have for him? This is what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is saying. أعذر الله, أعذر الله إلى مرئن أخر أجله حتى بلغ ستينه من عمره. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have an excuse for him anymore. Maybe when he's young you say jahil. You know when someone is young you say he's ignorant. Or just too enthusiastic, too motivated, hyperactive. There's a lot of motivation and enthusiasm in these youngsters. They're still young. They're still not aware of life. They still don't understand life. But once someone reaches the age of 50 or 60 years old, what excuse do you have for them? When you look at someone who's 20 years old or 25 years old or between 15 and 30 years old committing the haram, it's haram and wrong. But at the end of the day, you say still young. Insha'Allah, Afwan, excuse me. Insha'Allah, he'll snap out of it. Insha'Allah, he'll come out of it. But when someone is 60 years old and still committing the haram, what are you going to say about him? What excuse you? You're going to go and give him da'wah? How many times you try and speak to someone once they reach the age of 50, you can't even talk to him anymore? How many times I tried to sit down with someone who's over the age of 50? They look at you and say, You want to come and give me da'wah? Before you're even born, I knew how to read the Quran Kareem. That's how it is. I knew you when you're young. You know how many times people tell me, you know, I know you when you're young. What are you trying to say, Yani? <laughs> tell me, what's the point? Subhanallah, it's people's mentality. It's people's mindset. That's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in this hadith, that Allah azza wa jal has no more excuses for someone who reached the age of 60 and yet continues to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet this person continues to indulge himself in the haram. In the haram. Yet this person continues to indulge himself in the bad deeds and the evil actions. What excuse do you have for him?
60 years old. If this person doesn't repent now, when is he going to repent? And keep in mind, my brothers and my sisters, and this is something very important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to in the Quran Kareem. Allah azza wa jal alludes to in the Quran Kareem that the older you get, the harsher your heart becomes, the rougher your heart becomes. When you're young, and youngsters have a soft heart, that there is a weak hadith again, and some of the scholars say, it's uh, narrated by the Sahaba, that youngsters have soft hearts. They have soft hearts. When someone is young, especially after the age of puberty, they have soft hearts, even though they disobey Allah Azza wa Jal, even though they're probably committing the haram, even though they're indulged in the haram, but they still have that soft heart, they have that sp soft spot in their hearts towards the religion, towards Islam, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the older they get, that softness starts to wear away. That softness starts to wear out. That softness starts to turn into harshness. For that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran al-Kareem, أَلَمْ يَعْنِي لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَكُونُكَ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَكُونُكَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Allah says, hasn't the time came for those who believe in Allah and believe in the true revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to them for their hearts to soften, for their hearts to change towards the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the book of Allah and for them to repent back to Allah then Allah azza wa says, وَلَا يَكُونُكَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ and do not become like the previous nations before you do not become like the previous people and nation before you. وَلَا يَكُنُكَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَصَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Do not become like the previous nation before you. Whether you continue to procrastinate, they continue to delay. Later, later, when we grow up. You know that mentality for youngsters? With the age of 15, 16 years old, they love Islam. They love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even though they disobey Allah azza wa jal, and even though they don't follow the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam, even though they indulged in the haram, but they still got that soft spot in their hearts, and they love Allah azza wa jal, and they love Islam. But, inshallah, when we grow up. That mentality that we probably all went through when we're young. When we're young and we reach the age of puberty and we've got now hair under our arms and hair on our chest and we thought we are untouchable people and now we've got a license, we've got a piece and we could drive wherever we want and mum and dad can't speak at us because mum and dad can't hit us because if mum and dad hit us, I'm going to hit him back. You know that mentality? And now they're grand boys and they look good and you know they shave. You know that mentality, everyone? Especially the boys and the youngsters, they went through it. This is something that we probably all went through. So once you reach that age, but then you start thinking, you know what, I want to start going here, and I want to start coming there, I want to be involved with these people, I want to surround myself with that circle. But then he said, at the back of your mind, said, inshallah, I'll do that for a few years, and I'll turn back to Allah Azza wa Jal. I'll go back to Allah Azza wa Jal. That's the typical Muslim mentality. Maybe this person is drinking alcohol and saying, yeah, takes one zip, astaghfirullah. Another zip, astaghfirullah. And commit haram, and you know, some people have this weird mentality. I remember once a young brother, I think he was about 22 years old, 23 years old. He calls me from the city. After he just fornicated with a woman there, he tells me, is it okay if I have ghusl at home or do I have to have ghusl in the city? Like, I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I, I was stunned. This person just told me that he just committed zina and he's just worried about if, he's gonna, if Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive him to have shower at home. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow him to have a shower at home. But subhanAllah, at the end of the day, even though this person had committed haram, but you know what? There's that soft spot there. There is that soft spot that this person has. But you know what? That soft spot doesn't last for too long. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says, the longer you keep it before you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you delay it, that soft spot is going to turn into harshness. وَلَا يَكُونُكَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَصَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Allah Azza wa Jalla says, do not become like the previous nations before you where they continue to procrastinate and delay and later, inshallah, tomorrow when I grow up, when I pay off my house, when I make this, when I get married, when I have kids, when my kids have kids, when my other kids have another kid, this is how it is always. 
you finish from one thing, you, then you are struck with another thing, then you are faced with another thing, then you are going through another thing, and then you struck with something else. That's how it is. The first thing that comes to your mind, inshallah, when I get married. You get married, inshallah, when I have kids. When your kids, when the kids grow. When their kids grow, when they get married. When they get married, I need to help them to pay off their house. By the time you pay off their house, you'll be gone. Bye bye. Salam alaikum. They'll be praying on you. That's a reality. Excuses don't finish. These excuses that we always excuse ourselves with. That you know what, when I finish this, when I finish from that, when I grow up, when I graduate, when I get married, when all my kids grow up and so on and so on. These excuses never finish. Wallahi, your life will finish and excuses will continue. Work will continue. Work doesn't end. There's no ending to collecting money and saving money and there's no end to work. But your life ends and your work will continue after you. The issue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know and the matter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be aware of is that the longer you keep it, is the more distant you'll be away from it. The longer you keep it, is the more that your heart will deter and divert away from it. That's why grab it when it's hot. Hit the eye when it's hot. Alhamdulillah, you've got that soft spot in you. That moment that you feel, you know what, you are getting connected to Allah Azza wa That moment that your heart is shaking, grab it. That moment that your heart starts to tremble when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned or when you start thinking, you know what, I need to make a change. That's the time that you need to make that change or reform. Don't wait for it and say, tomorrow. Because you thought about it now, you're not going to think about it later on. You think about it now, you're not going to think about it later on. For that, my brothers and my sisters, when you speak to someone who's young, you find that they really want to make a change. But when someone reaches the age of 50, 60, you know what's their mentality? Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah Azza wa Jal that we started in a religion when we were young. And I haven't experienced the age of 50 and 60, and Allah alam if I live till then. But the way you see those who are 50 and 60 years old, if they stuffed up so much in their life, you know what's their mentality? They've given up. They've lost hope and they say, you know what? Let's see. Jahannam al Masir. That's their mentality. How many times you speak to people who reach the age of 50 or 60, in particular after the age of 60, and they know they've stuffed up throughout their life, and they know they've disobeyed Allah Azza wa Jal, and they know they've displeased Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, they've lost hope in Allah Azza wa Jal, or they lost hope in themselves that Allah Azza wa Jal will never forgive them, and that's why they say, you know what? As they say in Arabic, kharbani kharbani. It's destroyed and let it be destroyed. That's it, it's stuffed up and stuffed up. Might as well continue with it. But these people don't know. These people don't know. Little do these people know that Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive. And Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala forgive anyone. Let you be whoever you are. Whatever age you are in. Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive. Inshallah you are 100 years old. And your entire life you've been committing sins. And then that last final moment you turn to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Allah will forgive you. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the hadith that one of you will continue to do the deeds of the people of the hellfire until there's only one hand span between them and entering the hellfire. At that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change their life and they'll reform their life. So they turn back to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will admit them into the paradise. We are talking about someone who probably lived a hundred years. 99 years and maybe 12 months or 99 years and 11 months this person had been committing haram this person had been falling into the haram that last and final hour and that month he repents to Allah Allah forgives him and admits him into the Jannah there was a man during the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who he embarrassed uh, who, there was a man during the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who he embraced Islam who he embraced Islam that moment before his death, this man embraced Islam while the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on the battlefield. So you've got this non-Muslim who came and embraced Islam and asked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to accept his shahada. And then he went into the battlefield and fought for the sake of Allah and died on the battlefield without even praying a rak'ah. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke and he said, have you ever heard of a man that entered the Jannah and never prayed to Allah? In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi spoke about him. Have you ever heard of a man that enters the Jannah and never prayed the rak'ah to Allah Azza wa Jal? This is a man. 
This is a man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admits into the paradise and he's never ever prayed one rakat to Allah azza wa jal. His entire life disbelieving in Allah. Maybe some of his life was against Islam and against the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But then that moment he repented to Allah, embraced Islam and fought for the sake of Allah and died on the battlefield, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admitted him into the paradise. And what paradise we are talking about? The highest level of the paradise. Now the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, he says, whoever wants to see a man from the people of the paradise that never prayed to Allah, look at this man. In another hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, and he tells us about the story of that man that had committed all sorts of corruption. He had committed all sorts of sins. And then this man, when he was on his deathbed, he was on his deathbed. And he knew he's about to die and face Allah azza wa jal. He calls upon his children and he says to them, what kind of a father was I to you? What kind of a father was I to you? They said, you were a good father to us. So he says, after my death, cremate me, burn me. And when I turn into ashes, separate some of the ashes in the sea and other on the land. Put some of the ashes on sea and some of it in the, uh, 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 on land and some of it in the sea. So after he died, his kids did exactly what their father asked them to do. His children, his sons and daughters did exactly what he asked them to do. Even though they objected, even though they went against it, but he said, I command you. I command you to do exactly what I'm telling you to do. So they did that. So they burned him, cremated him, and then they divided some of the ashes in the sea and other ashes and some of it on land. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that created him from nothing, Allah azza wa jalla will command the ashes to get together and Allah azza wa jalla brings him back the way he was before his death. And then Allah azza wa jalla asks him the question, oh my servant, what made you do what you did? Tell me, what made you do what you did? For what reason you ask your children to cremate you and burn you and then when you turn into ashes to divide some of the ashes on the land and the other ashes and some of it in the sea. So he says, Ya Allah, the only reason I did that is because I fear you. And I knew that I'll be standing here. I knew that I'll be standing before you. And I knew that you'll judge me over the corruption and the sins that I had committed. And therefore, I wanted to get away with it. I wanted to escape this moment that I stand before you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the universe. Allah azza wa jalla, the most merciful. He says to his servant, the one that had disobeyed Allah azza wa jalla in the past, committed all sorts of corruptions in the past. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to him, oh my servant, because you feed me, I forgive you. Because you feed me, I forgive you and enter the Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Allah forgives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Allah is the most forgiving. Never lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never be despondent in the rahmah and the mercy of Allah. And that's why those who reach the age of 60 or 50 and they had stuffed up in their life and committed sorts of corruption and committed haram and they've been doing haram and been indulged in the haram, they start having this hopelessness. They have no hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them. And that's based on their ignorance. Little do these people know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. Little do these people know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have forgiven us. Allah azza wa will forgive them and Allah will have mercy upon them. But they need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness. That's why you find that age is a very sensitive age. And at the same time, it's a scary age. It's a scary age if they do not repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Allah doesn't have any excuses for someone who reached the age of 60 and yet they continue to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the hadith, Khayrukum. The best of you, Mantala Umuruhu wa Hasuna Amalu. The best of you are those who live long and do good. The best of you are those who live long and age old and they do good. They are the best of people in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the best of servants of Allah Azza wa The older they get and the longer they live, they use that for the sake of Allah. Why do we live for? My brothers and my sisters, why do we live for? We live for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means every single time that we have and every single 
extra time that we have in our life, that should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should be used for Allah azza wa jal. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees upon us that we live longer, it means Allah azza wa jal wants us to give us the opportunity to worship Him longer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us that chance to please Him longer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us the opportunity that we prostrate to Him and surrender to Him longer. So the longer you live and you use that for the sake of Allah, now that's the blessing of Allah upon you. And the longer you live, the longer you live and you use that in displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, know that this is from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. We want to live long and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala longer. We want to live long and want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our life. We want to live long and want to do righteous actions as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. An Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha qalat, ma salla al-nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, salatan ba'da an nazalat alayhi idha jaa nasrullahu fath illa wa yaqulu fiha subhanaka rabbi subhanaka rabbina wa bihamdik Allahumma aghfir li. Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha she says that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the surah in the Quran al-Karim in juz al-Amma in which Allah azza wa says idha jaa nasrullahi wal fath O Muhammad when the victory of Allah and the opening of Allah had arrived إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا and you see people flocking into the deen of Allah and and embracing Islam and entering Islam in large numbers and multitudes فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفر إنه كان توابا remember Allah عز وجل glorify Allah سبحانه وتعالى your Lord and know that Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the one that accepts our repentance this سورة it was revealed not only to tell the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah azza wa had granted him victory. Not only to inform the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah azza wa granted him the conquest of Mecca. But this surah was revealed to inform the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that your mission had been accomplished and completed and therefore you're going to come back to us. Therefore, you're going to die. And that's why the scholars say, or oh, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, the scholars of the Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, that the meaning of this surah, that Allah azza wa jal, he is not alluding to his victory upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the opening that Allah had granted the Prophet alayhi wa sallam. Allah is alluding to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, that your time had ended. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam understood that. Aisha says, Aisha says, that moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that surah to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she says, when that surah was revealed to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will increase from the praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he'll continue saying, subhanaka rabbina wa bihamdik, Allahumma ghfir li, all glory be to you Allah my Lord, and we thank you Allah and we praise you, oh Allah forgive me. See Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he lived longer, so what did he do with his extra life? Or, in other words, with his life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that time that Allah azza wa had given him, in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used that to the pleasure of Allah. Used that to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how beautiful to see the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. He is the one that's always been leading by a good example and the greatest of examples, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicated to him and alluded to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that his life is about to end in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa increase from the worship to Allah. Increase from the worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why sometimes we need to reflect upon that. And for that in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says another hadith, that live your akhirah, live for your akhirah, live your religion as if you're going to die tomorrow. When you put in your mind that tomorrow you're going to die. When you put in your mind that tomorrow you'll be dying. If you put in your mind that you'll be dying in a few more days. If you put in your mind that you'll be dying in a few more months. You'll become a lot more enthusiastic. And you become a lot more serious in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you know you only got a few hours left in your life. And you've got a few days left in your, of your life. Then obviously you're going to start what? 
You're going to start turning to Allah Azza wa Jal and put more focus in the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. You'll try and avoid disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. That's a true mu'min. Rarely that you find someone that knows they will be dying and the last thing they want to do before their death is to go and commit haram. And the last thing they want to do before their death is that they go and drink alcohol. The last thing they want to do before their death is for them to be drunk or the, for them to be off their heads. The last thing they want to do before their life, uh, their, their death, is for them to go and commit something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be displeased from. Which brings us to this hadith that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, يُبْعَثُ كُلُّ عَبْدٍ عَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ Every servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be resurrected in the hereafter on what they died on. Remember this hadith, my brothers and my sisters. And I wish that we could live by that hadith. We live our life in accordance to this hadith, that you will be resurrected in accordance to what you die on. If you die on the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be resurrected with the pleasure of Allah azza wa jal. If you die on the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be resurrected with the displeasure of Allah azza wa jal, with the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you die worshipping Allah azza wa jal, you'll be resurrected in the hereafter worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you die drinking alcohol, you'll be resurrected in the hereafter drinking alcohol. If you die committing haram, you'll be resurrected in the hereafter committing haram. And how awful and disgraceful is that, that you'll be resurrected in front of Allah and you are committing the haram. And how honorable it is that you'll be resurrected in front of Allah in the hereafter. You are doing the right thing. Imagine you die while you're praying. How beautiful of a death is this. Imagine you die while you're in the state of sujood. And how many of the scholars and righteous people and pious people died while they were in the state of sujood. These people will be resurrected in the hereafter prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine you die while you're in the state of ihram. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says that those who are performing haz or umrah while they're in the state of ihram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them and Allah azza wa jalla will resurrect them in the hereafter making talbiyah. Making talbiyah. That those who die while they're in the state of ihram, Allah Azza wa resurrect them in the hereafter. That moment that Allah resurrects them, they'll be resurrected saying, Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa na'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. What an honorable death. What an honorable death that you die on the state of ihram. Those who die reading the Quran Kareem will be resurrected in the hereafter reading the Quran Kareem. Those who die doing good things, they will be resurrected in the hereafter doing good things. But those who die committing the wrong, and those who die doing the wrong things, those who die committing the haram, they will be resurrected in front of Allah Azza wa Jalla in the hereafter committing the haram. For that, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, يُبْعَثُ كُلُّ عَبْدٍ عَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect every servant of his in accordance to what they died on. What you die on is what Allah Azza wa Jalla will resurrect you on. For that, my brother and my sister, that's a very important hadith for us to always to keep in mind and to be aware and vigilant of. We need to be attentive of this hadith in everything that we do. And every time you want to fall into the haram, remind yourself, you might die at that second. You might die during that moment. You might die in that minute. And imagine you die while you're committing the haram. Imagine you die while you're doing the haram. For that every time, and this is an advice for those brothers who are addicted to the haram. Because haram is an addiction. Those brothers who are entrenched in the haram, who are ingrained in the haram, and they want to come out of it. Just remind yourself, how about if you die while you're committing the haram? How about if you die while you're doing the haram? How about if you die while you're indulged in the haram? How ugly of a death is this? How ugly of a death is this? So many brothers told me that every time shaitan whispers and insinuates in their mind to commit the haram, they remind themselves of this hadith. That if I'm going to commit the haram and I die, what happens? What happens that while you are driving to the haram and something happens to you, you'll be resurrected in front of Allah Azza wa Jalla in the hereafter, you are going towards the haram and Allah is watching you. What an embarrassing moment. What a degrading and disgraceful moment. Imagine that you're involved in the haram amongst your friends, 
and amongst your peers, and amongst your colleagues, amongst your mates, you're sitting down and you're doing some haram, drinking haram or shooting the haram or doing some haram. Remind yourself, you'll die and your friends will leave you alone in this world. And in the hereafter, the first thing that your friends will do in front of Allah Azza wa Jalla hereafter is to put the blame on you. Ya Allah, He is the one that made us do the haram. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, يُبْعَثُ كُلُّ عَبْدٍ عَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ Every servant of Allah Azza wa Jal will be resurrected in accordance to what they died on. What you die on is what Allah Azza wa Jal will resurrect you on. For that, this is a goal. This is a goal. And an objective that every single one of us must aim for, must target, that I want to die doing something that pleases Allah. That's what I want to die on. I want to die on something that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to die while I'm doing something that will please Allah azza wa jal. I want to aim not to die on something that I'm committing the haram. For that there's a dua that we always ask Allah Azza wa Jal, O oh Allah, make the best of our deeds, khawatimiha, our final actions. Our final actions to be the best of deeds. For that in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, whoever says la ilaha illallah, before their death, they'll enter the Jannah. It's important that before you die, you say la ilaha illallah. So it could be the last action that you did and the last word that you uttered with. So that you face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. That you say, La ilaha illallah. And this is the quality of the mu'min. But you know what, my brother and my sister, as easy as it sounds now, as easy as you could hear it now, say, you know what, inshallah, when I'm dying, ashadu an la ilallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasulah. At that moment, it's not easy for you to say. At that moment, your mind will be drifted with the things that you loved. If you loved your wealth, your mind will only thinking, dollar, 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 dollar. And if it's about your family, 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 family. And if it's about your sport, 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 sport. And if it's about your business, 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 business. And if it's about your prestige and fame, prestige and fame, prestige and fame. And if it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Azza wa says, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthens. And Allah Azza wa Jal gives steadfastness to those who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world and the hereafter. This is the steadfastness and the firmness that you want to have before your death. Is to die on la ilaha illallah. To die on la ilaha illallah. That the final thing that you do and you say is la ilaha illallah. And that's why the beauty of Islam. The first thing that we do when a baby is born. What do we do to this baby? We make adhan. Even though that baby. Even though the baby can't speak and utter. The first thing we do, the first thing that we do to this baby is we make adhan in their right ear. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, to the end of it. So the first thing that we want this baby to hear are the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the last thing that we want this human being to say is La ilaha illallah, to die on La ilaha illallah. The last thing that we want this human being and the last thing that the Sharia wants and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants this human being to say is La ilaha illallah. So he enters with La ilaha illallah and he comes out with La ilaha illallah. This is your life. And within entering and exiting, in between, you live on La ilaha illallah. This is the mu'min. This is the quality of the mu'min. This is the quality of the believer. This is the quality of those believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. He wants them to live on Islam, to die on Islam for Allah Azza wa Jal to give them fairness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them firmness and for Allah Azza wa to give them strength during their life and when they face Allah, may Allah Azza wa Jal make us from amongst those who live on La ilaha illallah and from amongst those who exit on La ilaha illallah. The following hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, An Abi Dharrin, جندب ابن جناد رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قلت يا رسول الله أي الأعمال أفضل قال الإيمان بالله والجهاد في سبيله قلت أي الرقاب أفضل قال أنفسها عند أهلها وأكثرها ثمنا قلت فإن لم أفعل فقال تعين صانعا أو تصنع لآخر قلت يا رسول الله أرأيت إن ضعفت عن بعض العمل قال تكف شرك على الناس فإنها صدقة منك على نفسك. What a beautiful hadith. A beautiful hadith 
that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guides us to follow, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to better ourselves, in which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was asked by this great companion, Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, O Messenger of Allah, which of the deeds, which of the actions are the most beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal and the most finest to Allah Almighty? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Al Imanu Billah, believing in Allah Azza wa Jal, wal jihadu fi sabilillah, striving and sacrificing in the path of Allah. Everything starts with your Iman. Islam is about belief and action, not only belief. You know that typical Arab mentality, and a mu'min bil alb. I'm a believer in the heart. I'm, I believe in the heart. Alhamdulillah, I believe in Allah and I've got a good heart. Khalas, alhamdulillah, Allah Azza wa give me the Jannah. Because they've got a good heart and they believe in Allah Azza wa they're going to enter the Jannah. Maybe eventually you end up in the Jannah. But if you really have a good heart and you have a pure heart as you claim, then that purity needs to come out. That purity needs to come out. You need to have good actions too. But if you have pure heart and wrong actions, pure heart and impure actions, that, that, that does not resemble and that does not allude to that you're having good heart. And you know this typical Arabs, my father, my father told me, kill. My father told me to steal. My father told me to fornicate. My father told me to do this and do that. But don't lie. MashaAllah, Shuha Tirbaya hai. Now, MashaAllah, your father is a very good man. Your father told you to kill and steal and commit thar. Al Lisra was neat. Wa'mal, basmatik zib. That's mentality. How many times you hear that from people? It's like they take pride in it. They are proud of themselves and their father, that the father told them, do whatever you want to do, but don't lie. What kind of a father is that? What kind of a teacher is that? Your father needs to be himself. Your father needs someone to instruct him and to guide him and to, uh, to show him the right path. That's not right. Actions reflect upon your belief. You believe in something, then your actions reflect upon your belief. You have a strong belief, then your actions, your actions and your deeds reflect upon that good belief. But when people do wrong things, sometimes that's a reflection of the corrupt belief that we have. Because if you really fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you never disobey him. It doesn't make sense. If you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would not disobey him. How could you disobey someone that you fear? And how could you disobey someone that you surrender and adhere to? That doesn't make sense. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, the best of deeds and the most beloved actions to Allah azza wa jal, the finest of actions is the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the jihad fi sabillah. Then he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, which of the slaves are the most beloved and best to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, to give for the sake of Allah. Keep in mind, slavery existed back then, and a slave is like someone that you own. A master owns their slave. So I'm not going to get to details in that. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how about if I don't have the ability to go jihad? How about if I don't have the ability to free a slave for the sake of Allah? In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, help to do something good, or help someone else to do something good. Try and do something good. Or help someone to do something good. You yourself try and do something good. And if you can't do something good, help someone to do something good. Sometimes ourselves we could initiate good deeds. We could initiate to do good actions. But sometimes we don't even have the capability or the ability to do a good action. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if you can't then help someone that does good deeds. Because not everyone is a leader. Not everyone can initiate something. So if you can't initiate a good deed, then help someone that's initiating good deed. If you can't build a mosque, help someone that's building a mosque. If you can't give da'wah, help someone that's giving da'wah. If you can't teach Qur'an, sit down under someone who teaches the Qur'an. So at least assist someone that does good. If you can't do good yourself, assist someone that does good. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by this same companion Abu Dhar. He says, oh messenger of Allah, how about if I can't even do that? Now Abu Dhar can do that, and he can do even more than that. But Abu Dhar is just asking those questions. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum was so keen in asking the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about all things. They will never hesitate to, prophet, to ask the Prophet sallallahu of anything. And sometimes they ask things that they know they'll probably never reach to it, but in case. And subhanallah, that's better for us. Because what they thought they will never reach to, 
For us, it's a goal that we are trying to reach to. It's a goal that we wish to reach to. What the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum thought that we'll never ever reach to, the level that we'll never ever reach to, is a level that we we'll love to reach to ourselves. So their weakness is our strength. Subhanallah, that's a reality. Their weakness is our strength. And that's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in another hadith to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, if you, if you don't practice, or if you reduce 10% of practicing your religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not be pleased from you. If you neglect 10% of your practicing of your religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not be, Allah azza wa would not be pleased from you. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, but there will be a time from my nation where people will come, they'll only do 10% and Allah will give them the same rewards that he gives you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them the same rewards that he gives you. So one of them said, oh messenger of Allah, rewards in the equivalent of our rewards or their rewards in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, rewards equivalent to your rewards. Look at the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here this Sahabi is saying, oh messenger of Allah, how about if I'm someone weak? He can't, I'm someone who can't go and fight for the sake of Allah. I am someone who can't perform jihad. I am someone who can't do good or can't initiate good. I am someone who can't even help someone to do good. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, if that's the case, then keep your harm away from people. If you can't do good or help someone or assist someone in doing good, then harm people, then hinder the goodness that people want to do. Then hinder the path that people want to take in doing goodness. Then be an obstacle. Because some people probably can't do good. I probably I'm someone who's weak. I'm someone who is doesn't have much competency in doing goodness or doesn't have much of a qualification in initiating goodness. I'm someone who's weak, who does not even know how to help people do goodness. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, fair enough, don't do harm. Keep your evilness away. Remove your evilness away from people. We've got people these days that don't do good, that don't call for good, that don't support good. And not only that, they harm. They're just more of an obstacle. They just hinder what goodness people want to do. They just create an obstacle for the goodness that people do. Someone is building a masjid. I can't give, I'm poor. I can't help, I'm weak. So what do they do? They want to make sure that this masjid doesn't even go ahead at all. You've got people with that mentality, al-iyadu billah. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is so direct with his illustration, alayhi salatu wa sallam and guidance, in which he says, if you can't do good, at least help someone that does good. If you can't help someone that does good, then hinder the goodness that people want to do. Then be an obstacle that abstracts people's goodness and the path that people want to take. This is the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi salatu wa sallam wants us to be the best of people. Alayhi salatu wa sallam wants us to be the best of believers. Alayhi salatu wa sallam wants us to be the best of contributors. People who contribute to society, not people who are just a number. Islam is not after a number. The other day I had someone who came in and he started to ask about Islam. He said, hold on a sec, I'm not going to become a Muslim. I said, there's 1.7 billion of us. Don't think we are, we are short in numbers. Yani we're not going to get upset if you're not going to become a Muslim. Believe me, there's 1.7 billion Muslims. Half of them probably need to be thrown in the, in the ocean. Wallahu alam. I'll retract that anyway. Uh, Subhanallah, we've got 1.7 billion Muslims. 1.7 billion Muslims. We're not in short of numbers. There's a lot of us, mashallah. Everywhere you go, you find Muslims. There's no shortage of Muslims. Ma Allah Azza wa increase the Muslim Ummah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase the population of the Muslim Ummah. But the Muslim Ummah is not in shortage of numbers. We are in shortage of quality, not quantity. We want quality people. And that's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will always focus on the quality of people. Where are the quality of people? Do good. You can't do good, so help someone to do good. You can't help someone to do good, then be an abstraction. Then be an obstacle. Then be a hurdle. Then hinder the goodness that people want to do. This is the instructions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the teachings of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. For that, my brothers and my sisters, we need to always know, where do I fit in in the ummah? Where do I fit in in this ummah? What's my place in this ummah? What's my rank in this ummah? Am I only an extra number? Is that something that I want to be? Is that something that I take pride in? That I'm only an extra number of this ummah? Or am I someone who adds value to this ummah? Am I someone who contributes to this ummah? Am I someone who does goodness 
for this ummah. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa he told the Sahaba to be the best of people and those who come after the Sahaba. If you look at the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, each one of them was a nation on his own. Each one of them was a nation on his own. Each one of them was a positive contributor to Islam and to the da'wah of Islam. Each one of them had a place for them in Islam. Each one of them was part of the movement and revival of Islam, not just a number. How many Muslims these days are just numbers? Numbers, numbers. Muslim, Muhammad, or Ahmad, or Mahmoud, whatever, and so on and so on. It's sad. I've been going to the prisons recently, and every time I gather, Allah makes me cry. There's 2-3% Muslims in Australia, and there's 10% of Muslims in the prisons. That's something very sad for us. And you hear it constantly. Oh, you know what? You Muslims, there's only 2-3% of you in Australia, but there's 10% of you in the prisons. That's not something that we want to be proud of. This is just a number. Not only a number, but a number that's a burden. A burden. It's like, Ya Ammi Mishan, Allah, I don't even want you to be around. I don't even want you to be around. Like the other day, someone who came, I wanted to give a, you know, a donation, and at the top of that, giving you headaches. So I told the brother, I told him, give him his donation back, and tell him I'll give you 200 bucks, or Hilanna. <laughs> like a burden. Some people just a burden, an extra burden. And how many Muslims are a burden to the Ummah? The Muslim Ummah now is paying the price because of the stupidity of other Muslims. Just a burden. So not only are they not doing good, they're not doing good, they're not initiating good, they're not assisting someone with goodness. Not only that, they are bringing harm upon the Ummah. They are causing harm upon the Ummah. Bringing evilness upon the Ummah. What kind of Islam is that? What kind of Islam is this? What, what kind of an ideology is that? That's why my brother and my sister in Islam, you need to always remind yourself, are you just a number in this ummah? Are you just a digit in this ummah? Are you just a digit in this ummah or are you someone who's adding value to this ummah? Are you just an extra number just to be added to be part of this ummah or are you someone who's adding value to this ummah? Are you contributing to this ummah? In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in this hadith, that's again being narrated by Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in which he says, يُسْبِحُ عَلَى كُلِّ, على كل سُلَامًا مِنْ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقًا فَكُلُّ تَسْبِيحَةٍ صَدَقًا وَكُلُّ تَحْمِيدَةٍ صَدَقًا وَكُلُّ تَهْلِيلَةٍ صَدَقًا وَكُلُّ تَكْبِيرَةٍ صَدَقًا وَأَمْرٌ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ صَدَقًا وَنَهْيٌ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ صَدَقًا ويجزئ من ذلك ركعتان يركعهما من من الضحى ابو ذر رضي الله تعالى عنه says that the prophet muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم he says that every single morning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many rights upon you there are so many rights of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us from amongst those rights allah has a right upon you that you thank him for every joint that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you in your body and how many joints do you have in your body? 360 joints. You have 360 joints in your body. Allah Azza wa Jal has so many rights upon you. So many rights. From amongst those rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon you, that you need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thank Allah Azza wa Jal, and be grateful to Allah for the joints that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you. Can you imagine if your whole body is like this? You can't even, you just turn around. You can't even move the hand. Can you imagine that? Your hands just like stiff like that. Or it's like one piece. You can't even bend. Subhanallah. It's rahmah. But maybe that's something that never crosses your mind. That's something that you probably never thought of. That these joints that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you are a rahmah, na'mah from Allah azza wa ta'ala upon you. You grab with this hand. Can you imagine this hand was like this? Like a robot? Allah azza wa ta'ala gave you these joints. 360 joints. That Allah has rights upon you. That you thank him for every joint that he had given you. In other words, every morning you need to stop and say, Alhamdulillah, 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 360 times for every joint. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah for this. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah for that. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah for this. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah for this. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah for this. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah for that. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah for this. It's a bit of an exercise, isn't it? Thank Allah Azza wa Jal 360 times for every joint that Allah Azza wa Jal had given you. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says, when he says Subhanallah, it's a sadaqah, it's a donation. 
It's a donation and a contribution. It's a donation and a contribution into thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Saying Alhamdulillah is another donation. Saying La, La ilaha illallah is another donation. Saying Allahu Akbar is another donation. So these are some of the things or some of the ways and forms that you could thank Allah Azza wa Jal for every joint that He had given you. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, he says, Wa amrun bil ma'roofi sadaqa. Calling for which is good, enjoining for which is good, is also considered to be a donation. Wa nahiyun anil munkari sadaqa. And preventing from which is evil, and telling people to keep away from haram, is also considered to be a donation. And then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I'm praying to rak'ah. Praying to rak'ah, salatu duha to Allah azza wa jal, is enough to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the 360 joints. What salatu duha? Salatu duha is after sunrise all the way to dhuhr. And let's say five minutes after sunrise and ten minutes before dhuhr. So salatu duha is the prayer. Salatu duha is the prayer that you pray from after sunrise all the way before dhuhr, any time in between. You pray two rak'ah to Allah azza wa jal as a thank. And as thanking and being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the joints that Allah had given you. So the two rak'ah duha is thanking Allah azza wa jal for the joints that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you. Finally, this hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, and inshallah we'll continue next week with more on it. عُرِضَتْ عَلَيَّ أَعْمَالُ أُمَّتِي حَسَنُهَا وَسَيِّئُهَا فَوَجَدْتُ فِي مَحَاسِنِ أَعْمَالِهَا الْأَذَى يُمَاطُ عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ وَوَجَدْتُ فِي مَسَاوِئِ أَعْمَالِهَا النُّخَاعَةُ تَكُونُ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ لَا تُدْفَنْ In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presented to me the good deeds and the bad deeds and the best of the good deeds and the worst of the bad deeds then he says alayhi salatu wa salam and the best of the good deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had presented to me that I saw is to remove a harmful object from the ground you see something that's harmful, you remove it for the sake of Allah. And that also includes rubbish. You see rubbish, you pick it up and throw it. Do it for the sake of Allah. Don't say, you know, I'm not a rubbish cleaner. Do it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. You are driving and you find a big rock. Someone that did a haka, ghalaza. And Allah al most likely from Lakemba or Panchmal, throws it in the middle of the road. Remove it for the sake. Stop your car, remove it for the sake of Allah. You find a banana, a banana peel. You remove it for the sake of Allah. Don't just walk over it. You find, you know, a liquid or substance on the ground. You clean it and remove it for the sake of Allah. For the sake of Allah, just do it for the sake of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you reward. Not only reward, but from the best and the highest of rewards. Then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he says, and amongst the worst of deeds, that he alayhi salatu wasalam, he says, that you find the phlegm, that you find the phlegm that comes from the nose or from the throat, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you find it in the house of Allah and it's not even cleaned or buried. Now obviously the customs that the Arabs had back then is not like the customs that we have for example. Maybe what's disgusting for us is not disgusting for other cultures. And what's disgusting for other cultures is not disgusting for us. It's different. Like burping for example, here in Australia if you burp, people look at you differently. But overseas people burp is normal. It's a different culture. Now maybe during the time of the Arabs, they used to spit, and they used to spit in, you know, in the public. And uh, it's normal for them. Until now in many cultures, especially the Arabs, if you go to their countries, okay, spitting in the public on the road is normal. Here, for example, in Australia, or maybe European countries, but in particular Australia, spitting in the public is an ugly thing. And wallah, there's nothing more awful and disgusting to see when a Muslim, especially a bearded Muslim or a sister wearing the hijab, and spits in the public. That's bad image of Islam. That's a bad image, you know, sometimes just don't look at it, that what people think of you. Look at it, what people will think about Islam. Look at it, what people will think of Islam. If you want to ruin your name, Allah la iriddak. You ruin your name. But don't ruin the name of Islam. Don't be the reason that you ruin the name of Islam. And make people look down at Islam because of you. You know that moment that we attract so many people to Islam? Is that very moment that we've turned a lot more people away from Islam. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaks about how the flame sometimes is left unburied or cleaned in the masjid. In other words, if there's a dirt when you walk into the center, you walk into the masjid, clean it, don't just walk over it. We are very good when it comes to just looking at, oh, it's not mine, I'll just leave it. Do it for the sake of Allah. You see a dirt, you see a litter, just grab it and throw it. 
You see rubbish, grab it and throw it. And if you want to spit, spit in a, you know, in a tissue or spit in a sink and that's it. But don't spit in the public, it's not nice. It's not a good image. And inshallah, more on this is what we'll be talking about next week. Behaving the best of behavior in the public as Muslims and presenting Islam in the best of presentation. Because at the end of the day, every single one of us is a representative of this deen. And we all must represent Islam in the best of uh, representation. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those who listen and hear, act upon what they listen and hear. If there's any questions from the brothers, uh, please ask. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who act upon what they learn and hear.